Bom dia. Bom dia. Eu, eu acho que... Ah, ok. Apareceu o meu vídeo. Sim. Bom dia. Tudo bem, doutor? Come... Tudo beleza, embaixador Nestor. Muito prazer em conhecê-lo aqui. Online. Prazer todo meu. Deixa eu começar embaixador aqui. Embaixador Borges. Você sabe que a gente andou enfrentando aqui Prazer. umas intempéries, mas estamos todos vivos e well and kicking. Verdade. Pessoal, nós estamos live. Vamos começar, então? Legal. Ok. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ulysses Spurandio, and I am the president of Bratec. Bratec's objective is the promotion and advancement of commercial trade and investment between Brazil and the state of Texas, the entry door to the US, by way of conferences, seminars, meetings, missions, publications, education, and social activities, and other means of communication, using Texas as the entry door to the US market. Similarly, we also support the U.S. companies based in Texas interested in doing business in Brazil. Our focus is traditionally the oil and gas industry, but we also have expanded to other areas such as agribusiness and import and export, where we provide equal level of support. We rely on our extensive network of member companies that can provide the necessary support to start your business in the US, such as law firms, accounting houses, immigration support, and also we can provide you a physical space, offices and warehouses for you to start your company or to start your branch in the US through Texas. Additionally, Bratec can provide access to an extensive network of organizations and companies based in Texas, such as the Brazilian consulate in Houston. We have uh, our ambassador uh, consul in Houston, Jose Borges on the call. Uh, the office of Texas governor, we will have the secretary of state of the Texas uh, governor uh, making a video later on. The AMSHAN, American Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Houston Partnership, and the Port of Houston. And we also have in our members uh, the major oil and gas companies, such as Exxon, Chevron, BP, che uh, Schlumberger, Schwest, and many others. So today's objective is to provide you with a first-hand update on Brazil's policies towards the new US uh, administration under Joe Biden. And today, we will start by having a video from Secretary Ruth Ruggiero Hughes. She is the Texas Secretary of State. <clears throat> and then a live presentation from our <clears throat> Washington-based ambassador, new N Nestor Foster. And I think we'll start with the video first. So in this video, which was recorded especially for today's event, uh, Mrs. Ruth Ruggiero Hughes, Texas Secretary of State, will say a few words to our members and the participants on this call. So Cecilia, could you please? Hello, bom dia. This is Texas Secretary of State, Ruth Ruggiero Hughes. And I want to take a moment today to welcome you all to the Brazil-Texas Chamber of Commerce webinar on U.S. perspectives for 2021 under the new American administration. Thank you, Ambassador Forster, for this opportunity. Brazil and Texas hold deep, long-standing ties with regard to trade and culture, and thousands of Brazilians are proud to call Texas home. Brazil is Texas's number one South American destination for foreign direct investment and trade. And in the last year alone, trade between the US and Brazil topped $58.3 billion. Of that, approximately $13.1 billion was between Texas and Brazil. Brazilians play a vital role in ensuring our state's economic success, as well as enriching our state's culture. And Texas is host to Brazilian companies, Apollo Tubulars and Pilgrim's Pride, just to name a few. 
The University of Texas at Austin also boasts one of the strongest and most comprehensive Brazilian studies programs in the United States. And UT's Brazil Center supports Brazilian studies across academic disciplines to promote collaborative research and exchange between Texas and Brazil. This September, Brautec will celebrate its 20th anniversary, an incredible milestone and achievement. For the past two decades, the Chamber has been the premier organization for the development of lasting relationships between people conducting business in Brazil and Texas. Congratulations on achieving this historic anniversary. A new year is certain to bring new challenges, opportunities, and perspectives. But rest assured that the bonds between Texas, the U.S., and Brazil will remain strong. In fact, we seek not only to maintain, but to build upon this relationship to make it even stronger. Working together, we will help to secure an even brighter future for all. Thank you. So, yeah. Now I'll pass the microphone to Ambassador Jose Borges, our Brazilian consul in Houston, who will introduce Ambassador Nestor Foster Jr., Brazilian ambassador to the US. And Ambassador Jose Borges, please go ahead. Thank you, Ulysses. Good morning, everyone. I was very happy to hear that you're all well in the aftermath of Winter Storm Uri. I would like to start by today by thanking uh, Texas Secretary of State Ruth Hughes for the welcome remarks, which have so well underlined the special nature of the ties between Brazil and, the United, and Texas and the United States in general. I also would like to thank uh, the Brazil Texas of, of Commerce, uh, Brazil Chamber of Commerce, uh, Bratec, through its president, Ulysses uh, Esperandil, and its executive director, Cid Silveira, for accepting to host this event at such short notice. As you know, this event aims at establishing a closer connection with our embassy in Washington. And the idea came originally from Ambassador Nestor Foster himself, who thought that this was a good time to reach out to the main Brazilian chambers in the US. But before proceeding to the proper introduction of our keynote speaker, uh, let me remind you of the long-standing relationship between the consulate and Bratec. By tradition, the Consul General in Houston is also the honorary president of the chamber. And uh, my deputy, uh, Felipe, Minister Felipe Santa Rosa, as the head of the trade section, is the person in charge of keeping uh, a regular communication, a regular contact with Bratec. Our trade section is one of the 104th posts worldwide of the Trade Promotion Network of the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, today, for example, uh, those uh, 104 of these posts worldwide work together to promote Brazilian trade. And uh, for this event, for example, uh, Bratec organized the event in close coordination with Felipe Santa Rosa and the second secretary, Lucas Frota Pinheiro, who's the head of the trade section of our embassy in Washington. Well, having said all that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you my colleague and the ambassador of Brazil to the United States of America, Nestor Foster. A career diplomat, Ambassador Foster has, the, uh, has been, has served more than 15 years of his career in postings in the United States. And uh, uh, after graduating for the, the, the uh, the Brazilian Diplomat Academy in, in, in 1986 has spent all that time, 15 years of his career, serving in postings in the US. Ambassador Foster's host has also been the Charge d'Affaires of the Embassy of Brazil in Washington from June 2019 to October 2020. And since then, he's the full ambassador of Brazil to the United States of America. He has therefore the knowledge, the experience, and the credentials to speak to us about the very special and vibrant uh, relationship between the two countries and the prospects for the relationship in the near future. Welcome, Nestor, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Ambassador Borges. Thank you so much for uh, helping us organize this event. I want to thank uh, Bratek, uh, Ulysses Perangio, and all your team. Uh, I want to thank the kind message from the Secretary of State, uh, Ruggiero Hughes, for welcoming us here uh, today. Uh, you know, uh, it's especially important that uh, you helped us organize this in the aftermath of the winter storm. I hope everybody, you know, your families, everybody's doing well uh, in the aftermath of that storm. Uh, this is part, you know, our conversation here today, part of our effort, our outreach effort at the embassy to go a little bit outside the beltway. You know, there's so much going on in Washington all the time that's very easy to get, you know, become trapped inside the beltway. So this is the first uh, uh, in a series of events we have scheduled with chambers of commerce across the country. And uh, I think it's very fitting that Texas should be the first one, and especially Bratec, you know, which has such a tradition of uh, supporting our relations, you know, bilateral relations, the relations with the great state of Texas as well, which is, as was mentioned, the, our number one trading partner among the US uh, states. The topic that uh, you know uh, we're going to be talking today here uh, is about you know what's going on with the, our bilateral relations and with the new administration, and I would like to begin by saying that you know contrary to what uh, sometimes we read in the press, uh, the uh, the relations between Brazil and the United States did not start uh, last January twentieth. They've been go going on for almost two centuries. We're going to be celebrating in twenty twenty four the bicentennial of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Brazil and the United States. So we have a very long history together, uh, a history which is uh, in uh, many aspects unique to both our countries. Brazil does not have such a long standing relationship with any other country, not even with our neighbors, with whom sometimes we had skirmishes and uh, we broke diplomatic ties over time. Over these uh, two centuries, you know, in many occasions, uh, we work together, we work very closely, uh, one thing that I, I like to remind, just to put things in, in context, is for instance that the first Brazilian Republican constitution back in 1891 was inspired in the American constitution. Actually, Brazil's official name until uh, the mid uh, 20th century was the United States of Brazil. And at that time, you know, as you know, we fought together shoulder to shoulder in World War II against, uh, you know, uh, Nazism and fascism in the Southern Italy theater uh, in World War II. Uh, we built many ties between uh, our military since then. We have a tremendous cooperation uh, among our private sectors. So, you know, this relationship has this broader history. I will not bore you too much with, with details about that, but I just like to highlight that because I wanna uh, fast forward to January 20th and uh, the new administration being inaugurated, President Biden's administration. And uh, on that day, President Bolsonaro addressed uh, an important letter to President Biden, uh, congratulating him on his inauguration and uh, speaking exactly what I'm talking about here, the history, the long-standing history, and also the values, the very important values, which are the foundation of our relation. We're talking about, you know, democracy, the rule of law, respect for human rights, uh, uh, market-oriented economies, uh, and so on. Uh, and, you know, so the two largest democracies in the Americas, the two largest economies, sharing those fundamental values, I think it's, it's very natural that we should continue to have a very strong relationship, uh, you know, in, in the months and years to come. Uh, as I've said many times, the strategic importance that both our countries have for each other on, on both ways, this is not altered by uh, changes in administrations. There are permanent interests on both sides which frame our desire to work together and to cooperate and to deepen our relationship. In the letter that uh, President uh, Bolsonaro addressed to President Biden, he says uh, something like I, I just said, and he also mentioned some sectors. He kind of aligned the, the main points in our bilateral agenda looking forward. Uh, you know, he spoke about the trade and investment agenda specifically about investment in infrastructure, things we can do together in infrastructure. Uh, he spoke about science and technology, uh, about space exploration, a whole new area that's opening up for our bilateral cooperation. 
he also talked, which is uh, of particular interest for the state of uh, the great state of Texas, understand, is the whole question of, of energy and energy, energy cooperation. As you know, Brazil and US, we have a bilateral energy forum, which is very active and has uh, already uh, recently uh, met with a very uh, ambitious agenda. So the president laid out, let's say, some, some of the, the highlights, the main points in our agenda. And since then, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, moved forward with, uh, at one, and on one hand, uh, an engagement, a high level engagement between, uh, uh, you know, uh, cabinet uh, level uh, ministers on both sides, first and foremost, between our foreign minister, Ernesto Araujo, and the new Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, who had a very, uh, a very uh, uh, fruitful and positive uh, first conversation laying out the agenda, the willingness to cooperate on a broad range of issues from deepening economic and, and trade ties to uh, working together on human rights, on the environment, uh, on defending democracy in our hemisphere and beyond, uh, and so on. So those are, were, were positive uh, first contexts. We have, you know, uh, we, the embassy here in Washington has developed already a very good working relationship with the new a team uh, at the White House itself, at the State Department. So things are starting to move to move on. Uh, one thing that uh, has grabbed some uh, headlines uh, this uh, in you know recent uh, recent days and weeks uh, is the the opening up of you know a dialogue between Brazil and the United States on environmental uh, matters. Uh, we understand this is a priority for the Biden administration. Uh, it has been uh, placed as you know the perhaps the, the most important issue for the new administration uh, the whole question of sustainable development environmental protection climate change and so on and uh, you know i'm glad to report that we uh, were already able to organize a first set of, of meetings of bilateral meetings at a very high level including with uh, the special presidential envoy for climate change uh, secretary uh, john kerry uh, and his team and uh, those are ongoing uh, talks, which uh, will uh, pave the way for a strong cooperation of Brazil and the United States in this area. Let me just remind you, just, uh, you know, in the last, uh, the end of the last year, we signed a bilateral agreement called the Environmental Framework Dialogue, which should provide some of the basis for this continued uh, uh, effort of cooperation on both sides, uh, working together on the, the environmental agenda. There are many things we can do in that area, both at the bilateral level, uh, you know, uh, how can we cooperate to help reduce deforestation in the Amazon, for instance? Uh, how can we bring uh, economic opportunity for the 25 million Brazilians who live in that area? So uh, that, you know, we'll fulfill the big promise of uh, having sustainable development, you know, caring about the environment, but also caring about the, the human, the social component, which is uh, fundamental to, to everything we do. And uh, you know, helping us overcome what we call the Amazon paradox, the richest, the most wealthy uh, uh, region in Brazil in natural resources is also the one which has the lowest indexes of uh, human development indexes uh, in the country. So this is something that we need to address, you know, uh, making both things work together. There are many things we can uh, uh, work together at the bilateral level. I can expand about that uh, later on, on environmental uh, sustainable development issues. We also are ready to work uh, at the international uh, level uh, in the upcoming COP26 in November in Glasgow. Uh, Brazil is very open to the discussions on uh, carbon markets and so on. And uh, you know the whole question of remuneration of environmental services. So we see a whole range of issues where we could uh, uh, be able to work together. Looking you know, beyond, beyond the environment, there, uh, we've, we've been talking a lot with the private sector and this, this event, this conversation here today is, is part of that effort. We've been talking with, you know, associations, chambers of commerce in, in Brazil, here in Washington and beyond, and, uh, you know, companies, private sector representatives. And uh, we, we've been hearing what they, they want us to do. And uh, we've been, uh, you know, crying out of to, to pave the, the road for an ambitious agenda to continue to do what uh, we, we've done in, in recent years, specifically, as you recall, uh, last October, we signed three trade protocols on uh, business facilitation, good regulatory practices and anti-corruption measures related to trade. And those are now before the, the, uh, the, the Congress in Brazil for congressional approval. It's not, they, they don't require congressional approval in the United States. 
but in Brazil, they already been sent to Congress and are being examined. We expect a vote later this year, you know, hopefully by, by, by mid-year, we should have those uh, implemented. Those is, you know, it's a way to start building uh, up uh, a perhaps a more ambitious, uh, a broad trade agreement between both our countries. Uh, we want to continue in that road. We are waiting to, for the new administration to, you know, for them to sit at their desks. Yeah, as you know, the, the new uh, appointed uh, USTR, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Catherine Tai has not yet been confirmed by, by the Senate. We are waiting for that. And, uh, you know, as soon as she has her team in place, we are ready to, to engage in talks about uh, how we can work together on the trade agenda uh, uh, in a very uh, broad and, and uh, forward-looking way. Uh, aside from that, there are a couple of uh, you know specific issues. I just want to mention uh, those to you, which are in our radar here in, in, a, in, a, in a sense of priority. First and foremost is the renewal of the, the GSP, the Generalized System of Preferences. As you know, it's a unilateral program in which the United States grants some uh, some uh, tariff cuts for uh, you know foreign partners, and uh, the program expired last December 31st. Uh, already, we have discussion in Congress. Bills have been introduced to renew it. Uh, this is very important for, uh, you know, Brazilian exports, about 7% of our exports benefited from the program last year. And, you know, this is not just an, an aid for uh, uh, companies that are not in a position to, to compete in the market, much to the contrary, it's basically a way to level the playing field for Brazil, enable some of uh, sectors in Brazil to compete with companies from third countries, which already benefit from, uh, you know, uh, free trade agreements that the US has including with some, uh, some uh, South American countries. So this is one issue, renewal of the GSP. The other one is I think we, we should be able to, at least it's our wish to move forward uh, to remove the trade irritants that were put in place by the, the past administration, uh, invoking section 232, uh, specifically affecting Brazilian exports of steel, 90% of which is semi-manufactured steel meaning that you know, these measures, they end up hurting the American importer, the American consumer. These are, you know, this, uh, we, we don't think they make any economic sense uh, since 90%, as I said, are steel slabs, you know, semi-manufactured, which are finished in the U US creating jobs, generating a revenue here in the United States. Uh, we have, you know, uh, many things going on already. I just want to uh, uh, mention them briefly. I don't want to take too much in my, initial uh, remarks here, so we have more time for questions uh, uh, and answers. Uh, I just want to mention things that are going on and show the strength, you know, kind of prove the point I made at the outset of the strategic uh, re uh, character of our relationship and how it moves forward uh, uh, independently of, uh, you know, the, the, the administrations. Not totally independent, of course, you know, this is, we have to push it, we have to work on it, but uh, these are, let's say, uh, the institutional basis for what we do. And uh, going forward, they will provide us a frame for the work, uh, for the agenda ahead of us. So let me just mention very briefly things we recently did. Uh, just at this, uh, the end of January until just uh, two days ago, we had a joint uh, a military exercise between Brazil and the United States, which was the largest ever done by our military, it's called Operation Culminating. It brought a whole company of uh, uh, parachutists from uh, uh, Brazilian army here to a, a site in Louisiana. And they, they did a joint training using Brazilian equipment, the new Embraer KC-390 uh, transport aircraft, which uh, apparently performed very well in, in the exercise. So this is unique. It's the kind of exercise that the United States had only done with the United Kingdom and with Australia. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about just uh, taking place. We also were very pleased with the invitation extended by the White House to the Brazilian Minister of Science and Technology, Marcos Pontes, and the Brazilian scientist who uh, did the sequencing of the, the genome of the variant of the, the coronavirus that appeared in the city of Manaus in, in the Amazon. So we just had this two weeks ago Brazil uh, continue to be invited to this group. It's a small group of countries which uh, exchange uh, views on uh, treatment, vaccines, variants, you know, all aspects of the pandemic and see ways we can uh, work together to, to, to maximize, uh, you know, uh, our uh, efficiency in, in fighting uh, the, the scourge of the pandemic. Uh, 
there are also other things going on, you know, cooperation, for instance, I didn't mention the whole question of agriculture and how much we, we have, uh, have to work together. We've been working together and, uh, you know, it's already uh, the, the direction for the work ahead is already given with our very vibrant uh, agribusiness sectors in, in both countries, which compete a lot, including our, in our own markets and third markets, but uh, which also work together promoting you know, sustainable science-based agriculture, which is uh, uh, you know, what, what uh, we, we care about in Brazil and, and we understand also here in the United States. So we're already looking into ways in the, for instance, in the Committee for uh, Agricultural Cooperation, we're already meeting to see how we can continue to promote science-based agriculture in international fora working together. There's also lots to be done, for instance, uh, talking about uh, energy, on the whole question of renewable energy and ethanol and so on, looking beyond the, 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 the question, the specific question of opening third markets, but looking beyond that towards the establishment of a world market for ethanol, not thinking only in expanding, you know, the, the exports of, of both our sectors, you know, which are Brazil and the US, the two largest exporters of ethanol in the world, but also thinking about the whole impact, the whole environmental impact that a cleaner, uh, energy uh, can have. So uh, that's another area where we think uh, progress uh, can be made if we continue to work together. And uh, just to mention one last thing, we already uh, are implementing uh, an important agreement that was signed between the Smithsonian Institution, as you know, the largest museum institution uh, in the world, and the Brazilian Ministry of Science and Technology. And this will is something that we are we're very glad with because it will have some uh, important social impact, positive social impact in Brazil, which is a program that allows the use of uh, materials uh, of the Smithsonian Institution for a program called Ciência Science at the School in Brazil, reaching all the public network of public schools in Brazil. So this is one more uh, avenue of cooperation which is going on forward. Uh, you know, I'm sorry for the, the cursory uh, character of my, my, my brief presentation here. There's so much to talk. I'd rather leave some, uh, some room sometime for, to hear your questions, your suggestions. And uh, just let me know, let, let, let me uh, let you know that, you know, the embassy here in Washington is uh, open to, uh, you know, to help in whatever way we can. We know that the consulate uh, general in Houston does a superb job there with its trade promotion section. Uh, in, in uh, you know, working together with Bratec in the private sector. And, uh, you know, if you need anything from the embassy as well, we are here to work with you, our doors uh, are open. And it's really great to be with you here. Thank you, and I'm ready for any questions you might have. Excellent. That, that was a very exciting presentation. Thank you so much, in, uh, Ambassador Nestor. Uh, we'll go to the questions. I have a few questions here that we selected. And my first question is, uh, Ambassador Foster, uh, what are the top priorities for Brazil in terms of U.S.-Brazil relations in light of the income Biden administration? This question comes from Norman Nardoff, special counsel from Mayor Brown. Thank, thank you for that question. As, as I tried to outline a little bit here, you know, Perhaps in, if we want to put this in a nutshell, the main challenge we have ahead of us is to, uh, to keep moving, you know, to keep this very intense agenda, which we, we have built over the years, to keep it moving with a sense of priority as, you know, uh, the U.S. being our, our most uh, important partner. And, uh, you know, we see many strategic elements, as I pointed out, in our relationship. We want to move forward in all those fronts. Uh, those areas, those priorities for us, uh, you know, uh, one and foremost would be the whole area of uh, economic cooperation, trade, uh, promoting trade and investment between our countries. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, you are aware of, that uh, the United States has a very important position in investments in Brazil. Uh, recent data just published by the Central Bank shows that the U.S. has uh, a stock of FDI uh, in Brazil that is, for instance, five times that of China. Uh, you know, by far the largest Brazil is, uh, but United States is the largest foreign investor in Brazil. So, so that brings a whole, you know, connection between our private sector, which would, uh, you know, provide us a steam to move in, in, in the trade and investment agenda. But there's, you know, looking beyond that, 
there's the whole question of, which is, uh, you know, a priority for the current administration, as I mentioned, the whole question of environmental cooperation. And as I said, we're ready to do just that, uh, you know, uh, going a little bit more into detail, for instance, if we look into things we could do in the Amazon, as I said, the big challenge there is to, you know, generate opportunity for the people who live there, including the indigenous peoples, uh, uh, the indigenous peoples who live in, in the Amazon region. We have many uh, indigenous reserves there, some of them the size of countries, very large reserves. And, uh, you know, we have, we have several ideas and, and, and uh, things that are going on. Perhaps our cooperation could help us give or, you know, expand the scale of what's going on in areas, you know, bioeconomy with ecotourism, uh, you know, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, agriculture. There's, there's much going on there. And uh, we, we could perhaps expand that, get some, uh, uh, you know, new scale that would provide opportunity while preserving, preserving uh, the environment. Uh, we see perhaps other areas where we could work in this area, you know, bringing technology in, working together with, uh, you know, radar monitoring, using drones to, to, to see what's going on in terms of deforestation and fires, etc. We see, uh, you know, much to be done in that front as well. Of course, we have a very robust uh, scientific and cooperation, uh, scientific and technology cooperation uh, agenda. And we have the whole question of using the base at Alcantara for launching satellites. As you know, we signed last year the Technological Safeguards Agreement, which enables American companies to use the base of country, which is supposed to be perhaps the best place in the world to launch satellite, being just two degrees south of the equator and allowing for launches, you know, in either direction, north, south, or, or east or west. We have already some uh, over 10 American companies interested in using our facility there. And I think the, the goal is to have the first launch by the end of this year. We are working closely with the American companies. The Brazilian Space Agency is doing a superb job uh, in this area. We have the ongoing uh, cooperation in the whole uh, military and defense agenda I mentioned to you. Uh, just uh, you know, highlight, we last year signed an agreement called Research and Development uh, Testing and Assessment Agreement, which is uh, Brazil is the first Latin American country to sign this sort of agreement for the joint development of uh, defense products with the United States. This agreement is uh, now waiting for congressional approval in Brazil, but we are already exploring, you know, specific areas where we could uh, bring this cooperation uh, uh, to, to fruition. Then there's, I would mention uh, what uh, we, we just signed uh, also recently, Brazil joined the Artemis space project. You know, it's the most ambitious uh, space exploration project anywhere in the world, uh, you know, aiming at sending a woman to, to, to the moon. Uh, and then uh, having a, 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 a man uh, uh, crew sent to Mars for Mars exploration, the first, uh, you know, uh, uh, a crew, crew to be sent to, to, to Mars. So Brazil will be part of that as well. So as you see, it's, it's a very broad agenda. We could go on here, speaking of education, you know, the Secretary of State mentioned the progress that we have of Brazilian studies there uh, in Texas and in Texas universities. We have a very vibrant scene in terms of uh, students exchange between Brazil and the United States. Uh, of course, that was you know, somewhat affected by, by the whole pandemic issue, but uh, you know, that's been going on strong for many years. And uh, we think that you know, once we recover from the pandemic, we'll be able to resume and expand uh, that uh, as well. There's lots to be talked about about other areas. You know, uh, uh, we just see as a, you know, just to wrap up in terms of our priorities, uh, we also are very much engaged, as I mentioned, in the renewal of the GSP, uh, removing the trade irritants, that things that things should be sooner rather than later. That would be it in a, in a nutshell. Okay, thanks for that very comprehensive answer, Ambassador Foster. So I have another question here that originally came from me, and uh, you touched several points of that already, but I'll ask anyway and see if there is something new and perhaps give a, a, a twist towards the communication aspect. So, so we understand that this is the question. We understand the Biden administration expects to see a sound environmental policy, especially in regards to the Amazon, but also probably biofuels and carbon capture and all that. And they also expect to see a human rights policy uh, that is effective uh, in Brazil. Could you please address on how we are addressing this specifically and how we are mostly communicating these actions, because I think this is my personal percep perception. 
I believe there is uh, maybe um, not good enough communication on what we are doing in Brazil, perhaps outside and to the eyes of the US and to the eyes of the world, right? I think we, we can always do better in communicating, right? I mean, communication is always a challenge. So could you please elaborate on how we are um, acting and communicating effectively what we are doing in relation to uh, human rights and, and environmental policies? Excellent question, Mr. Sprendio. Uh, look, uh, you know, let me begin with the environment. Uh, there, there are two issues there. There is a, a, a communications, a messaging issue, which you know might present some challenge uh, uh, for us. We, we we need to improve perhaps our, our messaging and our strategy for communicating what we are doing, and there are challenges which are real on the ground. So we should not you know think that uh, you know this is only a, an image problem. It's not. A, it's only a, a matter of communicating better. No, no. There are real real challenges in terms of deforestation and so on. What we need to communicate better, perhaps, is the fact that the challenges we meet, let's tackle deforestation, which is one of you know, so many uh, environmental issues that we could talk about. But if the, 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 this trend, uh, the increase in deforestation, it's not something that started last year or in the last two years with right. the Bolsonaro right. administration. It's been going on for eight years. So we need right. to look at, at the, the, you know, what's going on and what we did wrong in the past eight years and how we can address the problem on the ground. That what we cannot do, we should not do, is if we do care about the environment, is to politicize the issue, which unfortunately is something that's done sometimes, and try to attach, you know, the problem of deforestation to this administration, or this political party, or this or that, and, and that's you know, that that's a, a, an assurance that we will not address the situation on the ground, only increase the the the, the ambient heat, let's say. Uh, so we have real issues. And I think there is a tremendous potential for us to work together with the United States and this whole uh, environmental sustainable development uh, uh, agenda, as I, I mentioned at the outset. Uh, we, we've, been, we've been very serious in terms of policies. We've been very serious about this. And, and that's another misperception, an important misperception that perhaps we should work to correct, which is that Brazil needs assistance from uh, the rest of the world in caring about the Amazon and realizing how important it is. We do not, we do not, we fully realize, we fully realize. And so much so that uh, if you stop to think about it, uh, about 82%, 82% of the original Amazon forest is still standing, is still untouched. Brazil has two thirds, two thirds, 66% of its territory with its original uh, uh, forest covering, natural uh, uh, covering. The United States in comparison has only 20%, 20%. Some European countries have 0% of natural vegetation covering their countries. So it's very easy to point to Brazil to try to politicize an issue right. and lose this perspective. So Brazil did something right. There, 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 there are trends, there are real challenges we need, which we need to face, but we, need some, we, we, we must have done something right because we still have the largest tropical forest in the world, the largest biodiversity in the world. And then when we talk about, you, you mentioned the question of energy and renewable energy and so on, Brazil has one of the cleanest, if not the cleanest energy profiles anywhere in the world. 82% of our electricity comes from renewable sources. 45% of overall energy in Brazil comes from renewable sources, being a hydro, biomass, ethanol, et cetera. So, uh, we're doing things that are right, and perhaps you know, in, in that front, we, we should improve our communications. Uh, you know, uh, in a nutshell, uh, we don't see, we don't think that Brazil is part of the problem when we talk about the environment, climate change, etc. We think Brazil is a big part of the solution. Moving on to the next topic, human rights. Now. Uh, there's, you know, we, we hear from some sectors, you know, concerns about this issue, that issue. We are ready to address all the issues that might be brought to us. But, uh, you know, we have not been able to see, to identify. I have not heard, the time I've been here, I'm in charge of the embassy for the past two years. Uh, we have not heard a single uh, uh, issue, an important issue in human rights, where there is a consistent problem in Brazil, much to the contrary. Environmental, uh, environmental human rights are guaranteed in our constitution, and there are you know a whole set of policies, 
uh, uh, on the ground to protect human rights from uh, you know all, all Brazilians, all Brazilians. Uh, let me give you an example here. With the pandemic, for instance, the, the Ministry for the Family, Women and, and Human Rights developed a specific problem, a program for the LGBT uh, community. You know, it's something that you don't hear about it, but Brazil has one program specifically to help these people overcome pandemic issues, you know, specifically at this community, which sometimes is, is presented as a, an, a, an area where Brazil could do more. So we have the programs, we have the commitment, we have the, the, the framework, you know, beginning with the constitution. Uh, I don't see that that's a major area uh, uh, of, of, of concern, but look, we're also ready, always ready to hear what people have to say, you know, to take whatever uh, constructive, honest criticism uh, might, might be. And uh, at the end of the day, sometimes what, you know, as, as good friends, we, we might have to, you know, agree to disagree. Right, yeah, that is very true. I can see the point on that. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, now, Ambassador Foster, pa passing on to the next question. Considering the new US administration, what is the Brazilian strategy for continued fossil fuel exploration in Brazil? At the same time, can you explore more on our potential on biofuels and alternative sources of energy in general? This question comes from Helder Weinard, uh, CEO of Swaxion and Brazil, one of the Bratec directors. Yeah. yeah. So again, you probably touch on those already more on the communication part. Excellent question. Look, in what regards fossil fuels, you know, we don't, the strategy, I mean, uh, uh, to some extent, this is a, a, a market strategy, you know, it's uh, almost self-regulating. We talk a lot about energy transition and uh, we are committed to that. Uh, Brazil has been selected uh, to, to head the high level dialogue at the United Nations on energy transition. And, uh, you know, we, we are very pleased with that. And uh, we have a strong commitment in that area. And I'll, and I'll comment on that. On what regards fossil fuels, I think, uh, you know, when, when, once we consider that we, there are some $23 trillion invested, connected to the use of fossil fuels in, you know, oil and gas and, and beyond, uh, you know, of course, this is not something that we can just uh, uh, press the reset button and turn a switch. And, and get rid of it. I think uh, fossil fuels will be with us uh, for, for some time. I'm no expert, I'm just voicing what, what I read here. Uh, I, can, I, I can speak a little bit more about uh, the, the question of renewable energies and, and, and ethanol and so on. And what I said on the outside is, I think there is room for cooperation between Brazil and the United States as the two largest producers of ethanol in the world. We're the two largest producers and the two largest importers, mostly from each other. It's a very interesting situation. There are, there are peculiarities for that. Of course, American ethanol is made based on corn. Brazilian ethanol comes from sugarcane. Speaking about the Brazilian sector here, well, the contribution that I see, I spoke with you know, great producers in the private sector. And what I've been hearing is that they are ready to engage in the sort of uh, expansion program that would not, as I said, just uh, you know, enable them to sell more ethanol to, to other countries but to create a world market for ethanol as a true commodity, uh, thereby you know, uh, uh, helping countries uh, such as uh, India, some uh, African countries which have the appropriate uh, climate co uh, conditions uh, to, to develop you know, uh, extensive uh, sugar uh, cane and ethanol industry. Uh, those industries could help us you know, address the, the whole environmental questions uh, before us, uh, you know, help us to face the, 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 the energy transition uh, effort around the globe and uh, basically increase uh, energy efficiency. There's something going on with the, what's called the second generation ethanol, which uh, uses the, the leaves of the, the, the sugar cane plant on top of uh, you know, the, the fruit itself uh, and enables us to almost double the amount of ethanol produced with the same amount of land and the same resources, the same plant. Uh, so the output is being doubled. And then there is the third so-called third generation, which is using what's left from the, 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 the process of, of distillation of ethanol, using that with, you know, there's an, uh, some uh, biotech component there with the bacteria that decomposes, that generates biomass, that produces, can be used to produce electricity. And this is, you know, this is not a pie in the sky, this is taking place 
uh, in Brazilian mills uh, as we speak. So you know you, you have a, a, almost a, a, a self, uh, an autonomous production of energy uh, in this uh, in these units that produce the, the 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 ethanol. They generate the energy they, they need uh, from uh, from the, the same plant. So these are tremendous opportunities that are ahead of us. And uh, you know it's not one thing or the other. Things will work, I think, uh, you know, together for quite some time. And there is even you know uh, what I've heard from the industry that, that there are even even this uh, whole application that can be used for electric cars with the so-called hydrogen cell where you have a, a small fuel tank that will carry 30 liters of ethanol will generate uh, the, the energy to propel the electric car uh, you know it which is a big contrast to the, the, the very heavy batteries that are used by electric cars today so just you know a few ideas that are uh, you know are, are being discussed with the private sector and where, where I see tremendous room for cooperation at the bilateral level, you know, private sector, government, and so on. Oh yeah, that's excellent. Uh, great, uh, a bunch of information, very, very concise. One thing that I would like to make a comment and note is uh, I noticed uh, in most, most forums and you know, all the, the, the pitch for the environmentalists is basically they talk about fossil fuel. But fossil fuel has different types of fossil fuels, right? And I think coal has been put together in the same bag as oil and gas, whereas oil and gas is much cleaner than coal. Okay. And as, as far as I understand in Brazil, we don't have a lot of coal production. We don't use a lot of coal, do we? I, I don't think so. Uh, uh, you know, it's mostly in the south where I come from in uh, Rio Grande do Sul, the southernmost part of Brazil, there are some, uh, uh, you know, coal mines. But we don't have big thermal uh, coal-based uh, coal uh, thermal right. operators uh, in Brazil. But as I said, 82% of our electricity comes from uh, renewable sources, mo mostly hydropower. And uh, mm -hmm. Ulysses, if you allow me, another element which is interesting also is that in this, the whole question of oil and gas uh, is that Brazil is opening up its market. Is something that's, that's going on. Is I, I understand there's great interest from American companies, specifically from, from the, the state of Texas. Uh, you know, Petrobras is divesting itself from, uh, from uh, the, the refining uh, sector, for instance. And we have uh, several uh, refineries slated to be sold, to be privatized in, uh, in the coming months, which should bring a great opportunity, you know? And uh, we like that there's a growing diversity in that market in Brazil. We already have 38 foreign companies operating the oil and gas sector in Brazil. And, uh, you know, there are opportunities for, for expanding that just to comment what I said before. Yeah, excellent. Oh, thank you for that. Okay, and moving on to the next question. Um, Texas will be the 10th, or would be, the 10th largest economy in the world by GDP, ahead of South Korea and Canada, and behind Brazil, just the state of Texas alone. Uh, what are the top export commodity se sectors that Brazil is focused on to export to Texas? That question comes from John Mosley, Chief Commercial Officer at the Port of Houston Authority. Yeah, well, I understand it. We, we know we already have a very intense uh, uh, bilateral trade between Texas and Brazil speaking bilaterally in the whole uh, oil and gas uh, uh, sector, including in parts uh, and equipment that's necessary for re refining prospection, uh, prospection and, and so on. Uh, looking beyond that, uh, I think we should seek for a, you know, a, a stronger integration on uh, thinking about the Brazilian companies that are already based there in the state of Texas. Uh, one that I like very much because of the technology is a company called Braskem, it's an offshoot of uh, Odebrecht, and which developed uh, very high-tech resin based on sugarcane. Uh, you, you, I think, I assume you're familiar with that. This is something that originally developed in the state of Bahia in the north of Brazil, and he moved that they plant to, to, to a place close to Houston in Texas, and they use it to, to, to build ink for the three-dimensional, the 3D print that's used in the International Space Station. And that's something, you know, perhaps we have room to expand more of that uh, high-tech high trade. In, in an overall uh, way, you know, uh, Brazil sells uh, to the United States, we sell more manufactured goods than to any other country in the world. 
China is our number one trading partner, but our exports to China are basically foodstuffs and minerals, iron ore and soybeans uh, taking uh, you know most of the scene there. Whereas the U.S., our largest trading partner, uh, has you know imports most of our uh, manufactured uh, products. And what products are, are that? They range from uh, manu uh, from uh, aircraft, you know, auto parts, uh, lots of uh, oil and gas in involved in this machinery equipment and so on. So uh, I would say those are areas that we could continue to work because those are the ones that have proved, uh, you know, uh, that have a, a strong market presence here in, in the United States and in the state of Texas. Very good. I think uh, we covered all the questions that we could ask today. Uh, so Ambassador Nestor and uh, Foster, would you like to add a few other comments before we uh, go to the closing remarks and adjourn? Look, Ms. Pellinger, I just would like to thank you so much and Bratek and the chamber there and also our, our Consulate General in Houston and Ambassador Borges and his team and uh, you know the Secretary of State organizing this conversation here today. And uh, just reiterate what I said before, that we are at your disposal in any way we can help you. Washington. We, you know, a very, very uh, moving forward with the new administration. And, uh, you know, we will soon be celebrating the bicentennial of our relations. We should be start, you know, working on, a, on the, a good agenda for the next 200 years of this very important strategic partnership for both our countries. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. We, we should do uh, some kind of communication together. We, in Bratec, we're also celebrating our 20th year uh, in activity. So I think it's a, another reason for a good celebration. So we probably can join them both. So I want to thank you, thank Ambassador you. Ernesto Foster, for a very exciting presentation showing our continued strong relationship with the U.S., also, I want to thank Ambassador Jose Borges, uh, Consul in Houston, for his comments, and most, and most of all, to thank all our members for their participation and their questions. We do have a few other questions that could not be answered in this uh, presentation, but we're going to forward them to your uh, offices and uh, hope to get some answers back to our members. Thank you so much. Thank you all, thank you. and have a good day. Thank you.